Hello, everyone. Today I'm very excited to be presenting Fish Time, our framework on the continuous longitudinal measurement of the effectiveness of anti fishing blacklists. My name is Adam Ost, and this is joint work together with my co authors at Arizona State University and PayPal. As you may know, phishing attacks use social engineering to trick users through malicious websites or messages. Although these may seem trivial on the surface, they occur at scale and cause real world damage. For example, Earlier this year, we saw a surge in phishing related to the coronavirus pandemic. Here's an example of a phishing website which impersonates a CDC donation campaign to respond to the coronavirus. Victims who visit this website might think they're making a donation when in fact they not only submit their financial information, but also their identities to fraudsters. Numerous mitigations have been proposed to protect users from these threats. Anti-phishing blacklists are a key technical mitigation the key ecosystem of defense, which is default in major desktop and mobile browsers and also integrated in other contexts. Blacklists use an automated crawler backend and seek to detect malicious websites and then add them to their blacklists. The goals are timely and comprehensive detection and a low false positive rate to avoid disruptions. Unfortunately, blacklists are vulnerable to evasion techniques known as cloaking, as identified in prior work. In this research, we focus on evaluating the blacklists which protect today's major web browsers. These blacklists include Google Safe Browsing, Microsoft Smart Screen, and Opera. We propose three key criteria to evaluate blacklists. Coverage is the percentage of known malicious websites that end up being blocked. Speed is the delay between attack deployment and blacklisting. And then there's consistency across platforms. Any gaps in these metrics can have security implications, which we want to evaluate in this research. Prior research has looked at individual anti-phishing entities and their gaps in blacklisting. However, in this work, we want to look at how vulnerable the ecosystem is as a whole to modern day phishing. And we do this by continuously monitoring blacklists to perform long term verification of baseline defenses and identifying any gaps that might exist in those defenses. In addition, we want to realistically evaluate blacklisting delays or blacklisting speed. We do this by discovering and then testing evasion techniques that real phishing websites use and we simulate ecosystem detection methods against these techniques. To carry out continuous monitoring and evaluation of blacklists, we propose the FishTime framework. This framework starts by monitoring the blacklist status of live phishing URLs, and we collect these URLs from multiple data sources. In our deployment, we used URLs reported directly to PayPal, as well as PayPal phishing URLs reported to the anti-phishing working group because we were collaborating with PayPal for the experiments later in this presentation. During our deployment, we collected about 4,400 URLs total. We immediately checked their blacklist status and discarded those that were blacklisted initially. Those that were not blacklisted, we actually took and reported them back to each respective blacklist, hoping that they would be acted upon. We then continue monitoring those URLs, and if they are not subsequently blacklisted, we scrutinized them further to understand what went wrong and why they were not acted upon. This left us with 183 URLs, or 4.2%. Although this might not seem like a large percentage, prior work has shown that individual phishing attacks, if sophisticated, can account for a significant proportion of victims. We then analyzed these websites to try to understand the various evasion techniques and configurations that may have successfully been evading mitigations such as blacklists. We then use these insights to design and deploy experiments, which deploy artificial websites, which are then launched and reported to blacklists and monitored uh, for the blacklisting status. And this uses an enhanced version of the empirical testbed test that we proposed in prior work. Using the insights provided by the FishTime framework, we defined artificial website configurations to evaluate blacklists. We started with a set of baseline websites that allow all traffic, just to serve as a control group. We also found some websites to use very basic evasion techniques, also known as cloaking, such as checking the user agent or checking to see if JavaScript was running in the browser. The more typical phishing websites, which accounted for the majority of websites that we identified, combined multiple types of cloaking. In particular, redirection links from the original email, as well as server-side or client-side evasion. In our experiments, we chose server-side evasion and redirection. We also observed some domains being reused as well as certain servers being reused. So we attempted to simulate this 
by reusing our own domains in certain experiments with the same configuration as uh, the set C here. Finally, in another deployment of fish time, we characterized emerging threats. And this include, included innovative evasion techniques that are based on user interaction with the phishing websites, such as CAPTCHAs, mouse movement, or pop-up messages that the user must click on. Finally, we identified new reporting protocols being used by the ecosystem, and we wanted to evaluate these. You may notice that group E is missing from this list. That's included in the paper and was a control group that served to evaluate our methodology. Here's an example of the artificial phishing websites that we deployed. They had the look and feel of paypal.com as of the beginning of 2019. At a high level, our longitudinal experiments consisted of deployments of multiple batches of artificial phishing websites as previously described. We had six total deployments and one preliminary deployment between March 2019 and January 2020. Each respective URL was simultaneously reported to numerous anti-phishing entities in an effort to simulate how detection happens in the wild. We then monitored the blacklisting status of each phishing website for one week across numerous platforms. Total, we had 4,158 URLs, and these were hosted on newly registered and randomized .com domains with extensive controls to prevent confounding factors, as we described in the paper. Now I would like to move on to our experimental results. Due to time limitations, I only cover the key findings in this presentation. Please take a look at the paper for our full analysis. Looking at our basic phishing websites with no evasion techniques, we observed very consistent blacklisting in five out of the six deployments. However, in the third deployment in September 2019, we saw a significant drop both from Google Safe Browsing and Microsoft Smart Screen. We looked into this and found that one of the anti-phishing crawlers that sent traffic throughout the other deployments apparently failed to do so in this deployment, or at least to the same extent. We notified the affected organization and we believe that this led to resolution of the issue. Now let's take a look at the blacklisting performance of individual blacklists and platforms. On the y-axis, we have the blacklist coverage with 100% meaning that every single website was ultimately blocked. On the x-axis, we have the speed, which is the number of hours elapsed between our report and the blacklisting itself. We observed that Google Chrome and desktop was generally the fastest responding blacklist, and by the end of our deployments, over 90% of the websites were blocked. Microsoft Smart Screen was a little bit slower to react at first, but ultimately managed to edge out safe browsing at the end of the experiments. However, the Opera blacklist, even though it reacted almost as quickly as Chrome at the beginning, ultimately had a much lower coverage. Finally, Google Safe Browsing, or Chrome on mobile, actually had a much smaller coverage in the long term, and we found this to be a key weakness of the ecosystem. Now let's take a closer look at blacklist speed and coverage and see how different phishing website configurations affect them. Note that in these measurements, we exclude the problematic detections that we observed in September. First, let's consider phishing websites with no evasion. These are blacklisted after a median 50 minutes with a 99% coverage. With basic evasion added to the mix, however, it took nine minutes longer for blacklisting to happen and coverage decreased by 5%. With the addition of typical evasion, so redirection with some sort of cloaking, the blacklisting speed dropped further to two hours and 48 minutes, as did the coverage. Even with infrastructure reuse, where we have the same domains previously detected as phishing, the speed with typical evasion was still slower than with basic evasion, even though coverage did recover a little bit. However, with emerging evasion techniques, those sophisticated ones that require user interaction, we actually saw no blacklisting whatsoever in Google Chrome. Comparing these numbers to mobile Firefox, we actually observe identical results, which is a testament to the excellent performance of this mobile browser. However, we were not able to replicate the same results in mobile Chrome, which had a much slower speed and lesser coverage in all cases. If we look at ways in which phishing is currently reported, most major organizations accept the bare URL representing the phishing website. However, if the underlying backend systems 
fail to retrieve the content due to an evasion technique, even resubmissions of that URL may not result in blacklisting. In mid-2019, Google released the Suspicious Site Reporter extension, which allows users to submit additional evidence, such as IP addresses or redirection chains, when reporting phishing through Google Chrome. Using artificial phishing websites, we sought to compare how reporting through the traditional channel compared to this enhanced evidence-based reporting. We found that over the course of the first four hours, the traditional method was in fact faster, even though they ended up having similar coverage after about four hours. However, in the long term, the traditional method resulted in just that same amount of coverage, whereas coverage continued growing for the evidence-based reporting. We therefore believe that this is a very promising technology and we recommend it for the entire ecosystem. In addition to our ecosystem findings, we made numerous disclosures following our research. As a result, the Opera browser now uses additional backend data sources, which has increased its speed and coverage, especially on mobile devices. Similarly, Google is working to enhance mobile blacklist coverage and has released new features in the latest version of Google Chrome, which we're unfortunately not able to test in time. Finally, we are working with the Anti-Phishing Working Group to offer Fish Time as an ecosystem level service to continuously monitor the ecosystem and continue making these kinds of measurements so that we can identify gaps and help protect users who might be affected. In conclusion, we believe that longitudinal measurements are key to understanding the current protections offered by the anti-phishing ecosystem. And they support a proactive anti-phishing approach, which can be used to discover new sophisticated attack variants. In addition, these kinds of measurements are not currently being done at the ecosystem level, and it's exactly what Fish Time is designed to support. Sophisticated evasion in phishing remains a key threat, and it's important to close blacklisting gaps on mobile devices and also improve data sharing, reporting protocols, and detection methods. In this work, we did not attempt to understand the impact of blacklisting delays on victims themselves. However, this is something that we discuss in another paper at this conference. Thank you very much for listening, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions.